Thank you. How are you doing out there? Let's see. <laughs> there are quite a few. Good. Um, I'm going to, I spoke yesterday, and so I'm going to rush through the first part so you can, if you weren't here, you can see some of the slides, and, uh, and I'll try to get my hardware working here. So I've got a, a note down here. I, I actually did a complete presentation. If you go into YouTube, you can find Building, Rich, Deep, Building Deep Rich Soils in New England. It's actually about every place, but they didn't want to, they, NOFA didn't want me to say that. So, so but uh, that's something you might want to look for. And um, let's start. Okay, here's your test. What are these? And what is this? I, yeah, I thought it was Osage Green, but I m made a mistake. <laughs> now imagine, you saw how big they were. Imagine a mammoth coming and grabbing onto that and just chomping it down, and there's great big seeds inside. And the mammoth poop made those seeds much more fertile. So this was quite a, quite a thing. So, so we've got a poop paucity predicament. You all know that. Um, we want the, well, we lost a lot of birds. We want the salmon to come back. The passenger pigeon won't come back, but, the, but the, what, wouldn't it be neat to see sockeye like in those numbers? And they're tearing down dams now in Idaho and Washington, so uh, it may come. And then remember the smell of being in a buffalo herd? And uh, would you stay in the same place or would you want to move? You know, so that's something to think about. We, we want to bring these soil back. My estimate is at least 100 tons per acre have been lost in places like this. Uh, I'll take other numbers if you have a better estimate. Uh, what is that? Okay. <laughs> um, and this is, an, again, how much soil has been lost here. There's doesn't look like there's a lot of organic matter here. A lot of bare ground. What is that? The Red River. Did you see the, well, there's a little bit of a, well, maybe, I don't know. You could walk across it. What is this right here? Caliche. And uh, I've got an award, I've got some caliche with me if you want to get close to it and rub it on your fingers. A lot, of, a lot of limestone. We are now inhibiting photosynthesis. We are also inhibiting humification. Those are words you should learn about, you know, because this part we, we can see above the ground, but this part is probably is just as important. Well, it is, is just as important, and we, we have a hard time understanding that. Um, is it happening again? Do we want to hear the paleontologists and what they think about this? Because we haven't been they haven't been part of the conversation, although in this meeting it's, it's starting to happen, so I think this is great. And, um, you know, is this the kind of future we want with the sulfur coming out of the ocean? Uh, I don't, but uh, the way you start here is you, you have to lose your polar ice and stop all those, those channels. And um, so I, I'm, I'm challenging everybody to be a medic. I, I was a medic uh, in the Army. And um, so what would happen if you're, um, you know, you're crossing the street here, you're getting ready to go home, and uh, you see somebody laying in the street, and they're unconscious, and they're bleeding. Would you run away? No. Somebody, somebody would, what would you do? You know? And I, yeah. You, <laughs> you'd do something. You know, you, you have that. Now, what if you see bare ground? What if you see a muddy stream? You know, you're going across the bridge on your car and you see a muddy stream. Do you get out and, and call 911? You know, um, this is an emergency. So, um, yeah, think about that. You know, bare ground is not normal. It's not normal. So, and I, I, I'll show this real quick. So here you got the biochar people saying, well, if I put one pound of carbon per square foot, how much is that on a big scale? Um, but you could put a pound of carbon any way you want. It could, be, it could be poop or whatever. But that's 20 tons of carbon per acre. If you go to 10 billion degraded acres, that's 200 gigatons, 200 billion tons. Well, that quite weirdly is 100 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, of CO2. That's the same amount of carbon. These, these numbers are all the same. So that's uh, just a way of... To help me think about it, the scale, 
you know, it's possible. It, it's been there before. The carbon's been in the soil before. You know, we could, we could take it to any level. I think when we get to 250, though, and it's going into Ice Age, we ought to have a party and uh, burn some coal. So, <laughs> so, because we could get to Ice Age and that would, but, you know, it's probably not going to be in the next three weeks, so. And then I, I didn't focus on this. Meadows said not only that self-organization is really critical, but hierarchical systems evolve from the bottom up. The purpose of the upper layers of the hierarchy is to serve the purposes of the lower layers. How are we doing? <laughs> oh, it's upside down. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I suggest that, that systems that work in a different way aren't, aren't sustainable, and I don't even want to use that word. They're just not going to last very long. So, so self-organizing systems, goals. I learned this from John Todd. I learned this from uh, Alan Savory, and we just started to talk about Lynn Margulis, and I said I was going to give you four names. That if you read everything they wrote, it would really help you see some of the stuff I, I get to see. I, I feel very lucky that I came across these folks. And uh, so there's John, and there's the, the experiment running from there to there. And there was my experiment at the chemical plant and the really ancient bacteria and, and algae that are up here. And, uh, you know, it's all, it was pretty dark at the beginning, and then it changed, and then fish were reproducing. You know, plants are, were trying to make seeds. And here's the, I didn't give you any results. Uh, 20 parts per million will kill the fish, and we never sent, this is the wastewater coming out of the plant. This is after it's been treated by the industrial process. And we, always, we could never get below about 20 parts per million. And after going through my, my kind of little pilot plant to see what, how it could do, it got down to one, which the fish could tolerate. Uh, uh, chloroform, we never could make water ever that didn't have 10 parts per million of chloroform. And uh, until, we, until we tried this living experiment. And BPA is a hormone disruptor, which a lot of you were talking about. We actually use BPA to make polycarbonate at the plant. And it's not very soluble, but we were getting up to 500 parts per billion. And it's active at maybe 10 parts per billion. So our system was getting it. Sometimes we couldn't detect it, but sometimes we could. So, so that's uh, give you an idea about how living systems can change things. Uh, here's one of, the, one of the people you want to learn about, Lynn Margulis. Uh, when Lovelock did the guy hypothesis, this was the brains of the guy hypothesis. Lovelock was trying to figure out feedback mechanisms and so forth. Well, she knew microbes. She knew them better than anybody. And so she had a theory of origin of species that included symbiosis, something that Darwin couldn't have possibly seen. Darwin intuited that we were all from the same cloth. We were all connected, which was huge. You know, the idea that humans were the same as animals and the same as plants and so forth. But Darwin saw a tree that went back and back and back, and he didn't see symbiosis. But look what Margulis came up with. You know, four different species of, of ancient bacteria that merged. You know, the, the ones that could breathe and use air, um, use oxygen, became the mitochondria in all our cells. We get all our mitochondria from our mothers, you know. And, and there was a lot of discussion about this, and they said, this is ridiculous, that can't be. In the, in the, this was in the 1980s. There was a lot of confusion. And Margulis says, well, maybe the way you test this is, can you find uh, DNA in, in mitochondria? And of course, they found it there. The mitochondria have their own DNA, and you get all that from your mom. And then plants, actually, we had a merger of ancient cyanobacteria, which was the first critters that could take electrons off of water and give off oxygen. It's probably the most important event in the history of the world, cyanobacteria, but they're in all the plant cells. Because an, an amoeba-like thing came along and swallowed some, some cyanobacteria and made chloroplasts out of them, that they found a symbiosis. It wasn't a competition after all, it was how we work together. So I think symbiosis is a much more hopeful interpretation of evolution than survival of the fittest. And uh, I said that, that's my quote, so. <laughs> you can quote me, so.
Uh, making homes for microbes is critical to eco-machines, John Todd's concept, and to soil building, which is what your business is. We're all in the soil building business. We're, we're not uh, in the soil eroding business anymore. So. so more poop, more possibilities, more fungi, more future. How many want a future? Okay. So now we're kind of caught up with where I was yesterday. This, this critter is, you've seen him before. This is, uh, you know, there were other, other cattle out there. Uh, you've seen her before. There's a lot of sheep running. This was an area that had no grass whatsoever about six or seven years before, and this was the Maddox's second ranch, and it was in January. But we're starting to get grass here. There's still a lot of mesquite, but uh, they weren't too concerned. And, uh, and then this is my kind of slogan picture. And in the 90s, we thought the way to get carbon in the ground was these dung beetles. And then when I started looking at this five years ago, I realized that that's a huge pathway, a possibility. Dung beetles take all that cow manure and put them below the surface so that methanotrophic bacteria can eat the methane, which is what we all want. We, we want to make uh, breathing soils that can eat methane. And, uh, but then a few years ago, I realized there's this other thing going on, this stuff that, Mark, that Christine Jones is talking about, that why do perennial grasses make all this sugar, glucose, and they give up over half of it to fungi and microbes? Most of it goes below the surface. Why do they do that? Well, maybe all this stuff going on below the surface is really important. And we hardly, barely know what's, it's like below the ocean. We just have a lot to learn. Um, five billion prairie dogs. There was a school in Texas that was 400 million, about the same place that I was showing you those pictures of the, the erosion. 400 million in one Texas prairie, prairie dog town. It's about 25,000 square miles. It was about three quarters of the size of Maine. 15,000 prairie dogs per square mile. Not quite as dense as Somerville, <laughs> but uh, you know, and they had grass. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Had grass and they had buffalo. Uh, oh, here's, here you go. These are some friends of mine, uh, the Richardsons, Pat Richardson and Dick Richardson. They heard this uh, rancher, Walt Davis, and he's saying, I quit using chemicals and a couple years later, the cow patties disappeared. You know, he quit using antibiotics. The antibiotics will really mess up dung beetles. The dung beetles had showed up. I could hear activity in the cow pad. 206 dung beetles going down in six minutes. And as they, she said a ton of wet manure overnight. The, the cow patties would disappear. That's what I want happening on my ranch. I want a lot of poop, and then I want it to disappear when I move the herd. So it can make that stuff underground. And there they are. This was at uh, the Maddox Ranch few years ago. They go down two or three feet. They're babies. See, cellulose is really hard to digest, and cows don't do a very good job. So they have to eat a lot of grass. And, uh, you know, and then they take it down, and they can build a whole ecosystem below the surface with the, the stuff that the cows didn't, didn't want. Dung beetles are starving all over the world. What do they eat? So that's a, that's a joke. And here's, here's the range. I've seen several maps of where dung beetles, the range of dung beetles is. Now, do we have animals in all these places? The only place they aren't found, historically, is in the permafrost. It's pretty hard to make a living in the permafrost if you're a dung beetle. But, but uh, wh do we have animals in all those places? So that's, that'd be interesting. So now I'm going to go a little bit east in a little bit wetter climate. Uh, this is in Missouri, right in the middle of the country. This is land that uh, they were haying for decades. The animals were off of it. They, they couldn't grow corn and couldn't afford to make a living. And they started growing grass because, well, actually, they started growing animals. And this is Greg Judy's uh, uh, farm. And he became a, he thought he was a, a, a cattleman. And then he thought he was an earthworm person. And now he says he's a microbe uh, uh, facilitator. And he said, because his goal was, if, if he had 25 earthworms per square foot, by all the poop that came up, with all that grass that he had and all the stuff that got trampled down, he thought he might get 100 tons of castings per acre. He's up to about 17 in some of his fields. 
Well, that's, I mean, if it was 10 tons per acre every year, that, wouldn't that be kind of cool? You know? So that's one of the people that you might want to put on your list. That's actually not, and that's his wife, Jan. And they're, uh, you know, you never see any depressed, uh, you know, soil builders, I don't think, so. <laughs> and then, now, now I want to say something about Christine Jones. All of her writing is on her website, Amazing Carbon. But we've been talking about the, there's been some confusion about what is liquid carbon? And I, you know, that's, that's unfortunate, but I thought, well, in photosynthesis, if you're a biologist, you know that CO2, that photosynthesis makes glucose. Glucose makes cellulose, glucose makes pectin, glucose makes uh, the, the, the cover of insects, you know, that's, um, mm, the name escapes me. Chitin. Chitin is a glucose product. Glucose is very hard to, you know, when you make it into cellulose, it's hard to digest. You can also make it into polysaccharides, and that's the sugar we eat, you know, and that we get energy from. But now glucose, when it goes below the surface, and it goes through a lot of biological processes, it becomes humus. And the, the fungi people said the stuff that's exuded out of, uh, out of uh, fungi is, uh, they call it glomalin. But it's, you know, to her it's all humus. So this is the liquid carbon pathway. We're trying to get a lot of glucose below the surface to make big molecules that are incredibly stable. And this is, this is interesting. See, this is a membrane, a cell membrane. And look at all this activity here. This is the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell. All this big, complex, slimy stuff, sticky stuff is being made. And this is a normal situation. But when we bring cells into the lab and try to study them, this all gets washed away. And we don't really understand it very well. It takes a, it's very hard to study. But we're just finally figuring out how to do that. So this is way back to when my professor in college was studying cystic fibrosis. And uh, he was talking about the glycocalyx back then. So, so those are words that it's fun to figure this stuff out. So brain tissue. You know, I asked Christine Jones, uh, how, how big of this mass, if it's acres and acres and acres and square miles in size, when does it become conscious? And she didn't want to answer that, but uh, here's some, this is my hand, this is uh, trying to grow mushrooms in Maryland, and uh, look, at, look at how th rich this stuff can be, you know, if you get a, give it a good medium. Look how deep the grass can go, you know, big blue stem can go down 10 feet. This is turf grass, Kentucky bluegrass. This is why you have to feed it all the time. Okay, thank you. And uh, these are shiitakes. This is, uh, this is actually a famous farm. Uh, it's Paul Stamets' farm. This is oyster mushrooms. This is my favorite. Uh, so now this is fungi.com. And that's one guy you want to read everything he wrote. Mycelium running, how mushrooms can save the world. How do you bring the salmon back? And uh, what's the driest place in America? This is a rainfall map. And people usually point right here. All those tough students said it was right here. So let's go look at that place close. This is a gold mining tailings pile that had been run cyanide through it. Uh, a family, the Jerry and Tony Tipton, decided to bring cattle out, put hay up there, because they thought, why do hay in the barn? Why not do it out on this terrible place that was starting to blow nasty stuff around? Nothing had grown on it for years, and the cows just followed. She, she took uh, 100 bales of hay up the hill and, uh, that day, and uh, the cows followed her. And this was, uh, this was six months later. They had more grass than any place within counties. I, I think it was 1,200 pounds of dry matter per acre, something like that. Inch of rain. So now in Nevada, if you were to restore it, well, all right, it'd be great if you could bring cows and all that kind of stuff, but it's hard to do. There's not a lot of animals out there. But what if you just let the beaver do what they do? This is Susie Creek in Nevada. Eight inches of rain a year. This is uh, Maggie Creek in Nevada. The, 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 the beaver have gotten loose. So, okay. So we've got uh, grass soil hope, Courtney White. That's a good one. The, the reason beaver are so effective is because they dig channels much deeper than we realized. And their, their pools have to stay w wet all winter. So, so that's... Uh, did beaver come to Nevada before? Well, this is the trapping areas. 
And of course, uh, Candace, you've got uh, several in uh, South Dakota, you know, right near Carbon Ranch. Elaine Ingham is uh, something you ought to know about. These are uh, Alaskans, Lowenfels and Lewis, that wrote Teeming and Microbes. It's, it's Elaine Ingham's work. They summarized it really well. And there she is with the soil food rub surrounding her. And uh, paradigms to consider. Microbes must have a good home for ecosystems to be healthy. Uh, Peter Donovan says, can you see the elephant here? Why are we dividing it into a bunch of problems? Why don't we feed the elephant? It'll make a lot of poop. The tough students had a hard time seeing this at first. So. All right, this is uh, right now, this is my uh, homeschooled class. I've got s Jane Hammer found six homeschool students that wanted to learn biology, and they're, they're studying for AP biology, even though they're, like, they're 13 to 16. And here they're going to see a living machine that was going on up near the uh, New Hampshire border, uh, Ed Tivnan. And here's Precious Peary, came and showed up at class the other day, and after 48 hour, eight hours of travel, she kind of hung out with us. And it was great, you know. And uh, so you'll hear here in a minute. So I just uh, wanted to say for the last slide here, Project Dandelion. You know, we, we, we're trying to kill dandelions. The chemical industry is trying to kill dandelions. But, uh, so what happens when dandelions are around for a while? You get a lot of clover. But dandelions bring a lot of calcium to the surface, and you get a lot of clover. <laughs> and uh, when you get clover, you get nitrogen in your soil. So why are we trying to kill them? I, I would sell, tell every kid to go out and, and, you know, find those parachutes and spread them all over the place. Infiltration data, the different ways. Amherst campus that we did the thing on. This is turf grass. Not even as good as corn. So anyway, uh, there are those that are trying to set fire to our world. We are in danger. There is time only to move slowly. Not a time to panic. There is no time not to love. So I love the whole of symbiosis. And uh, thank you for hanging out.